Uh, so today I'm going to talk about RCU in two, 2019, uh, you know, the latest uh, stuff. I work for Google, um, and uh, yeah, um, that's the penguin with the magic pen, and this is my magic pen right here. So I'm going to show you the magic that RCU is about and how it works and things like that. So my recent work history, uh, I joined Google in 2016. I work on the task scheduler uh, and BPF for tracing on our Android devices. So this uh, started in 2016. Uh, and this is complex stuff, I, I would say. And in 2017, I started exploring uh, RCU internals. And this is uh, very complex stuff, even more complex. 2019, my daughter turned two years old. And I would say this is very, very complex stuff. <laughs> Believe me, she's more complex than RCU. So <laughs> this is what is going on, OK? Uh, so how did I get started with RCU? Uh, so I worked on Linux for uh, you know about a decade. And I saw that uh, very few people understand RCU. I, keep, I kept hearing that. Uh, you know, there's only a handful of people, less than seven people, who really understand how it works internally. And I saw this as an opportunity. And I also love synchronization in general, how synchronization prim primitives work. And I was kind of tired of looking at RCU logs and, uh, you know, RCU stall reports. And this kind of drove me to really try to understand how it works because it was irritating me. And I thought it's time to put an end to the, to the mysteries. So this roughly started in 2017. Uh, and these days, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems like I've convinced myself that I know enough about it that uh, I'm able to you know, spend time on it. And my main motivation is to help the community uh, and the company I work for, which is Google, understand RCU and uh, you know, deal with RCU issues, concepts, uh, discussions with people. And I also work on improvements uh, that, uh, whenever I can, and uh, new features that we're coming up with for RCU. So that's basically my story. Um, so when I started off, it was like uh, in 2017, I was like, uh, you know, pinging uh, people on the mailing list, like Paul, and I was, uh, I was kind of telling him, like, oh, I, you know, I, this is uh, this is amazing. Uh, but can can we not do it this way? Can we not do it that way? And I, you know, kept telling him about we can just do it this way or that way. You know, the existing RCU design in the kernel. And to that, Paul would would tell me like he would tell me, here's your nice little algorithm, and he, he would send me a picture like that, like a puppy dog. <laughs> and then then he would say, here's your nice little algorithm equipped to survive in the Linux kernel. <laughs> which is a bear. So his point being that you know uh, it can be a simple implementation, but it has to be complex because of the real world that where the Linux kernel has to survive. And uh, in a way, uh, Paul considers this, and even I can see it, that RCU has kind of evolved from the puppy dog to the polar bear over a long period of time. I'm relatively new, like around two two years or something like that. But uh, I've seen like the patches, uh, the history, and it seems like it's a, it has been a long evolution. So obviously, uh, uh, credits go to Paul and all the great people like Stephen and uh, you know all the other people who really uh, made RCU what it is. So all the credit uh, goes to them. Uh, it has been many decades and. Paul has, act, has been working on RCU even before the time of Linux. So it's a, it's a very long history of uh, the synchronization technique. OK, so that's, uh, that's a little bit of history. So let's get started with, uh, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so the agenda is, I'm going to introduce RCU to kind of show you like how it works and like the, the, you know, the magic. It's, it's going to be a very gentle introduction. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the bear, which is tree RCU. 
And I'm going to talk about recent work we have been doing this year and last year on the RCU flavor consolidation. And I'm going to talk about TAS RCU and, if time permits, which I, doubt, I highly doubt, uh, list RCU API improvements. OK, so the magic, right? So the basic idea of RCU. Let's start, let's start with that. Consider, uh, consider some shared data that you have to read and write from different CPUs, different threads. Uh, and the idea is, how would you make sure that uh, readers and writers are uh, synchronized correctly so that they don't step on each other, or writers don't step on each other? Uh, and one way to solve this would be to use a reader-writer lock. Readers and writers are mutually exclusive, and writers and writers are mutually exclusive. At any point in time, you can either have a reader, you can have a bunch of readers or a writer, and writers and writers are mutually exclusive as well. So you can only have one writer at a time. So you can use a reader-writer lock to uh, synchronize access to the shared data object. Uh, so before we get into how to apply RC, let's introduce some concepts. RC read side critical section is basically a section of code that you uh, mark as an RC reader. Uh, and you would use the RCU dereference API to ac get access to a pointer first before you actually read it. Um, for the purpose of this talk, let's just consider that RC dereference is a, a straightforward assignment. So you're just reading a global pointer and assigning it to a local variable, and then accessing the data in that uh, object. So first, let's talk about what's a question state. So question state, uh, let's think of it as a state that uh, an entity like CPU has to pass through that is impossible to do in an RC read site critical section. Okay, So it's, a, it's, a, it's just a point in time or state that it's impossible that this state would occur inside of a read side critical section, OK? So just memorize that for a second. And then let's talk about what's a grace period. Let's define that. So grace period is a certain, is a weight that if waited for, for that uh, duration of the grace period, um, we are guaranteed to have waited for all uh, readers that started before the grace period started. Okay, So when does the wait end? The wait ends when all the uh, CPUs have passed through a question state. So it starts because uh, a writer started it, which will be more clear when I show you the, the RCU uh, application. And it ends when all the CPUs have passed through a question state. That's when the wait ends. Okay. Uh, so if you put the last slide and this slide together, that th this implies that if you wait for a, a grace period, you would have waited for all readers that started before the wait started to finish. Because you have waited for all the CPUs to pass to the question state, and question states are impossible in RC readers, you have, would have waited for all RC readers. Uh, so that's, that wait is called a grace period. So here's an example to show this. Here we have uh, a system where we have three readers and one writer. And the writer starts uh, a grace period. And uh, remember what, you, what I told you, the grace period ends when all the CPUs pass through crescent state. So uh, the CPUs pass through crescent state, and then there you can see the grace period ends. So the writer has waited for all readers. As you can see, before the red line, it has waited for all readers to finish running, right? Because the question state is impossible within the RCU reader. So uh, by extension of that, the writer would have waited for all readers. Because question states are impossible within RCU readers. And ultimately, you will arrive at a question state. So the writer would have waited for all readers that started before the grace period started. And uh, it's important to uh, point out here that uh, readers that start after the grace period started need not be waited for. So here you can see a RCU reader that started after the question state on CPU2. 
and that reader need not be waited for for the grace period to end. Is that, is, does that make sense? Uh, hopefully it does make sense. Ask me later, I'll explain it to you for any number of uh, hours on how this works. But I hope it makes sense. Uh, so now let's apply RCU to that problem we just talked about where we were solving it with our reader writer logs. Reader writer logs. Uh, and this is the way we would solve it with RCU. Uh, so the reader, as I showed you, it acquires a read log, uh, RCU read log, which marks the start of the reader, read side critical section, gets access to this uh, object that we're trying to read. It reads it, and it uh, does a RC read unlock. In the, in the writer, what we do is we acquire a, a spin lock. The, in RCU, writers are mutually exclusive. So two writers uh, still have to synchronize with each other. It's only the readers and writers that run concurrently. But the writers still need to synchronize. So that's why we have a spin lock there. And uh, the. Uh, pointer is accessed, and what we do is we create a copy of the object. We don't modify it at the same time. Readers and writers are concurrent, so we, we don't want to uh, do this update if there are any readers that are still reading it. So we first make a copy, and then we modify uh, whatever we wanted to modify, and then we assign the global pointer that is accessed in the reader. We assign that with the modified copy. Yes. I might not have time for questions, but. It's important now. Uh, is the RCU the reference in the writer actually necessary? And if yes, then why? Uh, it might not be necessary. Okay, yes. One more question. Or is it? Steve. Yeah, it, it's concurrent, uh, so yeah. it does a read once, so. It's uh, sort of necessary, especially for the static analyzers. Uh, we do, and there's ways you can say it's get it for a lot. But yeah, it, it helps a lot with the static analyzers to ha always do that. You don't, if you don't have it there, then it might, it, uh, static analyzer may not know that that's protected by, for an RCU. But for correctness, it's not needed. But right, yeah. Right. But for documentation and for okay. static uh, analyzers, you want something. Like okay. That. Yeah. So. We do the uh, modifications to the copy, and then we assign the global pointer with the copy, and then we do the unlock, right? So now we have this copy. Oh, I have to point out, after we do the assignment to the global pointer, uh, at this point, so there, ca there can be readers that access the pointer before the assignment and after it. So depending on when the readers were it's essentially a, a race that we're introducing here. So readers might have accessed the old pointer or the new pointer. That's OK. You know, either they'll see the old copy or the new, co new copy. We don't care. So we do the unlock so that you know, the point of the spin lock is that only one writer can, access the, can write to the pointer at a time. You don't want multiple writers to write different versions of an object. Uh, you know, it's, it's a mess. So that's the whole point of the spin lock. And after the spin lock, now we have two copies, right? So we have to uh, free one of them. Others will run out of memory if writers keep, keep happening, right? So we'll run out of memory. So we need to free the old copy at some point. It is safe to free that copy only once all readers are done accessing the old copy. That's what synchronized RCU is. That's what the grace period is. Synchronized RCU waits for a grace period. The old copy is no longer accessible after the grace period because all readers that did the RCU dereference are no longer, uh, you know, uh, no, uh, no longer exist. So we can free the old copy at that point. So what if the reader takes too long? What? What if the reader takes too long? What if the reader takes too long longer than the grace period? Uh, no, no, so the readers can never be longer than the grace period. The grace period will be longer than the readers. And that's why you have RCU stalls, if you have readers that take too much time. So let's see uh, the scalability of uh, RCU. So this is from the RCU usage paper. 
And here we have a reference count implementation using shared integers, using an integer. And you have RCU that is acting like a reference counter. How? You can mark sections uh, that are referenced with RCU read lock and unlock. And you can see here that as the number of CPUs increase, the cost of RCU read lock unlock is flat as the cost with using a shared integer goes up. So this is a very great illustration of scalability of RCU. It's the fastest known uh, read mostly uh, synchronization primitive. Okay. Now conditions do apply. Uh, this is the common case. There are, can be situations where things have to be handled during the RCU read unlock, and that can add uh, more cost. But those are those are not the, that's not the fast path. So writes are costly, so you have to wait for the grace period. Uh, you have to wait for the grace period cycle. So it's time cost, and the grace period cycle management itself is a cost because something has to manage that gray spirit. The good news is that the writes, uh, you can have several writes that do synchronize RCU or call RCU or whatever, and they share that gray spirit. So the cost is amorti amortized. Uh, you know, so you divide the cost by the total number of writers that are sharing a gray spirit. This is also why gray spirits need not, are intentionally not short. We want them to be a little long so that we can share multiple writers uh, uh, within that same grace period, and the cost of that grace period would be divided by those writers. Okay, you can even have thousands or m even millions uh, of writers sharing a grace period. So the writes are costly, but uh, it's, uh, it's not that bad. Uh, so when do you use it? You want to use it when uh, your writes are t less than 10%. Of uh, the reads, uh, if you have too many writes, then it's not a good idea to use RCU. Uh, and the reader-writer lock can be an alternative in those situations. Um, and there's a lot of documentation I've pointed out here that you can go through to see when to use RCU and when not to use RCU. I don't want to spend time on that right now, but so let's uh, to get a sense of how we one can implement RCU. Let's take a toy implementation. And uh, the toy implementation, this toy implementation works only on preempt n kernels, on non preemptible kernels. In this implementation, RC read lock and unlock are no ops. Can you believe that? No ops. Um, and synchronized RC is implemented by having a thread run on all the CPUs once. Uh, and the reason this works is because it's a non preemptible kernel. So the fact that synchronized RCU ran on all the CPUs means that you can have a notion of that thread running on those CPUs to be a crescent state of some sort. Um, and uh, once the thread runs on all the CPUs, you can no longer have any readers. Because if you had a reader, then uh, you wouldn't be able to run the thread, the, the thread running the synchronized RCU, because it's a non preemptible kernel. So why won't this work on a preemptive kernel? Can anyone answer that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. You, you know everything. So. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I think yeah. I think you're going there. Yeah. I think I think that makes sense. But the reason is basically if you had a re if you had a reader section on a CPU and it was preemptible, then you could have the synchronized RCU thread run on that CPU in the middle of the reader, right? Actually, the way I would say it. Yeah, Steve can explain it. Yeah, basically, you're saying that a schedule happens to be, by running on every uh, CPU, you're scheduling. And since the kernel's not preemptible, the schedule is a quiescent state. So by not, if you have a preemptible kernel, you just put a quiescent state in the middle of the grace period, which Evalu uh, you know, it screws it up, yeah. yeah. And if this happens in the middle of an RCU reader, then the synchronous RCU running on that CPU doesn't mean that you're in a question state. As we discussed, question states are impossible within RCU readers. So uh, why is this a bad idea? Like, what is the problem with it? Can anybody answer that? What is, what could, why is this not a good idea, even on preemptible kernel, even on non-preemptible kernel? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
In which situation? Like when? It's e well, I would say it because uh, if that guy gets stuck, if there's like a real-time task running and it doesn't ever let it run, you just yeah. Then your grace period goes on. Your grace period could be forever. Yeah, <laughs> and then the other reason is if you have thousands of CPUs, now you have that thread has to run on all those, so it's not That's scalable. Not yeah. I'd be more worried about never, it never ending. Yeah, yeah, Pr yeah, yeah, pretty much. So that so this can be considered as a puppy dog solution. Now let's look at the polar bear. Or the bear. That's tree RCU. Uh, it's the most complex uh, for flavor of RCU. There are different types of RCU. There's tiny RCU, SRCU, TAS RCU, and all that. But tree RCU is the most complex and widely used. And this is a, a Paul on the mailing list some years ago. <laughs> uh, he, he worries about this stuff. And uh, he says if he didn't worry about it, then it wouldn't even work. Uh, so he has added a lot of redundancy, and uh, it's justified, and that's, that's the story. So let's talk about the bear. Uh, so it looks, like, uh, it looks like a tree. It's tree RCU. Uh, see, what you have is you have uh, this tr uh, tree structure. It, the tree uh, has, uh, is bigger for a large number of CPUs. Uh, and what you have is on the leaf nodes of the tree, you have CPUs hanging off of it. You can have, if I remember, it's maximum of 16 CPUs per leaf node. The, each node in the tree is represented by RCU node structure. And each CPU is represented by RCU data structure. The RCU state structure ties all these nodes together into one tree. Okay, So let, in, let's not worry about the data structure too much. Let's try to build an intuition for why the tree uh, is necessary, right? So the whole concept of crescent state is it's a global operation. It's a system-wide operation. All the CPUs have to pass through the crescent state, and then finally the system has to uh, like know that every CPU has passed through the crescent state. Now, now the grace period can be ended. So it's a global operation. Now imagine if you had a naive algorithm that was working on some shared data and you had thousands of CPUs. In that case, uh, you know, that wouldn't work well. So the tree, this is actually called a combining tree, and it's, the point of it is it acts like a giant shock absorber. All the CPUs are, you know, trying to report crescent states, and the system has to agree on um, that, you know, all the CPUs are passed through crescent state, and it has to do this uh, in a scalable way and in, in not an, a naive way. So the tree acts like a giant shock absorber. So let's go through an example to kind of see how it works. Uh, when RCU starts a grace period, it actually goes, to the, goes through this whole tree and sets up this bit mask, QS mask. Uh, and uh, here, it's of, here there are only two bits in this example. You have two CPUs. This is a four CPU system. You have two CPUs attached to each of the leaf nodes. And those leaf nodes uh, are attached to a root node. There's also a C per CPU flag, but uh, I don't want to go through that right now. The, the per CPU flag basically says that the CPU, it's a C CPU local information about whether the, the CPU has passed through a question state or not. It's called the CPU no QS flag. First, so let's say in this example, CPU 1 has reported a question state. That results in clearing of uh, the first bit there in the, in the local, uh, in, the, in, the, in the node that that CPU is attached to. Second uh, question state uh, is, uh, is uh, provided by the C CPU 3 in this example. And that clears the uh, bit in its uh, leaf node, in the one that it is attached to. Um, now CPU 0 reports a question state. And uh, both the bits in the leaf node are now 0. So once that happens, uh, it now reports question state to its parent, to the, to the root node. And then finally, uh, CPU 2 reports a question state. And that updates the mask in the leaf node that the CPU 2 is attached to, which updates the QS mask in the root node. That, the root node is kind of like the global thing, OK? 
so as you can see, four CPUs reported uh, question states, but only two updates were required on the root node. So imagine a system with thousands of CPUs. Now you would have only 64 updates on that root node. Um, that's how the tree is you know, created and stuff like that. So it's kind of like scalable. It's like a global way of arriving at a result that the question state has been uh, crossed on all the CPUs. There's a nice documentation about this. Uh, I'll let you read that. It talks about all the data structures and all the, and exactly what I'm talking about, about how the combining tree acts like a giant shock absorber. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the components in tree asks you to make it work. You have uh, the uh, timer, you have a soft hierarchy for every CPU, and then you have this grace period thread that manages the whole uh, grace period. So let's try to see how this works. So you start a gra when you st a grace period starts when somebody does some some thread does a synchronize RCU. This results in queuing of a callback on that CPU, and it results in requesting of a new grace period. Okay, so here we have different components. I've color coded them. Uh, the new grace period is the writer requests a new grace period, and that causes the uh, the grace period thread, that that global thread, to wake up, and uh, it propagates information down that tree that the grace period has started. Okay, and at this point, all the CPUs have to now report question states. Uh, so for the CPUs that are not idle, the scheduler tick checks. The scheduler tick, whenever it, it occurs, it checks whether we're in a reader section or not. If we're in a reader section, it doesn't do anything. But if, if we are in a reader, if we are not in a reader section, then it can say that the CPU is now in a, in a, a you know, crescent state. And what it does is it uh, first checks if a grace period is in progress, and then it raises a soft RQ. Now, the soft IRQ is what does the propagation of the tree, as in the e example I showed you. That's what does it. Uh, the soft IRQ does that propagation. Now, the th thing is, if a CPU is idle, then nobody's there to do it for that idle CPU. But somebody has to update the tree that, that for that idle CPU. So that's done by the grace period thread using the Dynetix framework. And it does the exact same thing. It, uh, marks the crescent state, propagates it up the tree, all that. Same thing happens for a no hertz full user mode CPUs, by the way, uh, because the scheduler tick is turned off for those CPUs as well, so, so, so crescent state has to be uh, reported for them, and that's done by the gray spirit thread as well. All, finally, when all CPUs are done, you have that root nodes QS mask, as I was showing in the example, that's now zero. So the grace period can end, right? And the grace period thread notices that. Now its job is to notify all the CPUs that the grace period has ended, so that the CPU on which that callback was queued, it can actually um, execute that callback. So it notices it, and it executes the callback. That's done from the, that's done by the scheduler tick noticing that the grace period has ended, and it. Uh, raises soft RQ, which executes a callback. I kind of jumped ahead. I was I wanted to say that the the writer thread enqueued the callback on on the CPU, and uh, you know finally well, what that callback does is actually wakes up the the thread that went to sleep, um, and you know when the grace period has ended, and that's that's the process that happens there. Hopefully it makes like some sense, but if you want more details, please uh, contact me later. I'm happy to explain this to you to any degree after this talk. So let's go through, sorry. Let's go through uh, what are the different types of question states are. So you have this implied question state, which is essentially, uh, for you know, CPUs are in a certain state, so that implies that they're in a question state. You have idle CPUs, offline CPUs, CPUs in user mode. These are, these are CPUs that cannot possibly be executing a RCU reader section because they're not in kernel mode. So they cannot possibly be executing a, a, a RCU reader section in the kernel because they're not in kernel mode. Um, then you have the lightweight question state, which is basically uh, 
uh, updating that flag I was talking about on, on each CPU, the per CPU flag. It just updates that saying that the CPU has passed to a quiescent state. However, it cannot end the grace period because remember I told you the grace period is a global process and the whole system has to agree on that the grace period has ended, right? That's why this is lightweight, because it doesn't end the grace period, but it updates that flag that says that, that C for that CPU's informational purposes, it has passed through a question state. Heavyweight question state, on the other hand, are question state that can end the grace period. They do the whole propagation of the tree, and uh, that's expensive. So every time this QS mask is updated and you go up the tree, that's, that, that, that requires acquiring locks, and it acquire, you know, naturally will involve atomic instructions and this, things like that, so it's not free. And this heavyweight crescent state can only happen after the lightweight crescent state has happened. Let's look at an example to see this uh, in action. So here you have uh, a CPU with uh, three tasks that are context switching continuously, and uh, you have the... I didn't go through the examples of where does the lightweight and heavyweight happen, sorry. So the lightweight question state happens uh, from the scheduler tick and the context switch path. The heavyweight question state happens from the soft IRQ and from that FQS loop in the GP thread. That's, these do the heavyweight version of it. And then the RC read unlock, which I was telling you that it's not free in all cases. In some, uh, in some cases it does more work. This does the heavyweight stuff, okay? So here you have, uh, so in this example here, you have uh, lightweight question states that happen on every context switch, right, between different tasks. The heavyweight ha one happens only on the uh, soft IRQ. So the lightweight one ha may happen a lot of time, but the heavyweight one will happen rarely. So that's kind of the idea, the difference between light and heavy. So now I'm gonna throw more stuff at you, I'm sorry. Let's understand some concepts here. Uh, let's try to understand the need resketch flag. What does a need resketch flag do? When you have a higher priority task that wakes up on a CPU and a low priority task is running, you can have this need resketch flag that is set. It's set by the scheduler. Um, and the scheduler decides whether it should set the flag or not, if I understand correctly. And at the end of the interrupt, we... Uh, the, uh, the interrupt return looks at that flag and now it knows that it needs to enter into the scheduler because that flag is set. So this is kind of the way uh, wake up preemption works. When something high priority wakes up, low priority task needs to be scheduled out, high priority task needs to be scheduled in. Uh, tick, uh, this is tick preemption. Uh, tick preemption also kind of uses the same technique. In this example, what I'm showing you is you have two tasks that are, uh, you know, in the fair scheduler, and they have their own time slices, right? Like, you know, when one task runs enough no one amount of time, you want to run something else. That's also taken care of by the need reset flag. What happens is the scheduler tick notices that a task has exhausted its time quantum, and now something else needs to get CPU. Uh, so that happens through this need reset flag as well. Now, if preemption is disabled, uh, so if a task is, has preemption disabled, and then the scheduler tick happens, and it notices that time, the quantum has expired, uh, it sets the flag, but nothing can happen until preemption is enabled on that CPU. The preemption of one task to another cannot happen. So that's just a little detail to remember. If preemption is disabled, then the preempt enable Whenever that happens, it will call into the scheduler because this flag is set. Uh, so RCU kind of abuses all this because remember, uh, context switch is actually a, a, you know uh, is actually a quiescent state. Not in all cases, but most of the time, if I understand, a context switch is a is a quiescent state. Uh, so what happens is that the gray period uh, the gray period has started at uh, 100 milliseconds, the grace period thread says, that CPU is blocking the grace period. I need to do something. And it sets this per CPU flag. That per CPU flag, urgent QS, the scheduler tick on that CPU that is blocking the grace period, it sees that flag is set. That the grace period thread has informed it that, please do something. And the scheduler tick 
sets the need reset flags, the same flags that I was talking about, which take care of this preemption and all this stuff. Sets that flag, and the next at the next possible instant, uh, we enter the scheduler whenever we can. So that happens at around 100 milliseconds. Okay. So if preemption is disabled, the scheduler take notices this proceed flag, sets need reset, and the next opportunity, whether that's uh, return from the tick or the next preempt enable or whatever, we uh, enter into the scheduler and that results in reporting of quiescent state. Let's talk about the concept of con resked. Con resked is uh, a no op on preempt kernels, but on non preempt kernels, uh, con resked actually can uh, voluntarily uh, release control and enter into the scheduler. Uh, and uh, you know, so it's kind of like a preemption point, okay? So because con resked is kind of like, is, is a quiescent state, it's impossible, as I said, quiescent states are impossible in uh, RC readers, which means that if you had some code like this, this is a bug. You cannot have code like that does con resked in the middle of an RC reader. Okay, so we can use this concept to our advantage. As I was saying, con resked means reporting of quiescent state. However, it's not, it's not a heavyweight quiescent state. It's a lightweight quiescent state. So at 200 milliseconds, the grace period thread sets another flag, which the con resket uh, function reads. And it, it now converts that lightweight quiescent state into heavyweight quiescent state. A lot of detail. I'm, I'm very sorry. 300 milliseconds, what the grace period thread does is uh, it looks at, it, it's desperate now. 300 milliseconds have passed. What, what can we do to make that CPU pass through a quiescent state? And so for no hertz full CPUs, what it, no hertz full CPUs are CPUs that don't have the scheduler take running on them. And what it does, it decides to send IPIs to it. And in the IPI handler, RCU knows uh, whenever interrupts are entered into or returned from. And it, uh, in RCU, we turn on the uh, scheduler tick. We turn it back on, because we're desperate to end the grace period. Uh, and that turning on of the scheduler tick actually eventually re results in a, a question state report. And uh, I fixed a bug where the scheduler tick was not getting turned on, thanks to Frederick Weisbeck. And we actually solved some out of memory issues that Paul McKinney was seeing. So it, it does it does all these tricks, like it's trying to set flags and you know, trying to end the grace period sooner on those CPUs that are blocking the grace period. At one second, the grace period thread doesn't do anything. This happens in the scheduler tick itself. The tick notices that it's been one second since the grace period started, and it sets uh, a flag that request for help from the RC read unlock. Uh, say we, you know, the scheduler tick uh, happens when we are in an RC reader section. In the RC reader unlock, we can actually do more. We don't normally do anything from RC read unlock because we want to keep it cheap. But if the tick notices that the grace period is blocked for so long, it sets this flag that the RC read unlock notices and it and the, it reports a question state from that unlock path. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I was just trying to show you what the grace period rate does and what its purpose is, and it does a lot of work to end the grace period, basically. If you don't end the grace period, we might have run out of memory, uh, we might have RCU stalls and things like that. So with that, let's talk about <laughs> a slightly less uh, intense topic, trust RCU. And uh, yeah, Stephen presented that he's using TAS RCU in F-Trace. And somebody, um, yeah, and basically it's about, uh, he's using dynamic trampolines for F-Trace function callbacks. He's using this dynamically allocated piece of code that's allocated whenever you have a function callback that is registered to run uh, from a function entry. So he has this trampoline, it's called a trampoline. So. <laughs> Have you guys heard the Beatles song, We All Jump on the Dynamic Tram? <laughs> it's actually a yellow submarine, but. Um, so, anyway, and then somebody uh, posted a tweet saying that Joel's going to explain how this works. So, I had to had, I had all these slides in the last two, uh, day or so. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, 
Um, <laughs> So, so what's, go, what's going on, or what's the problem? So the problem is that F-trace, uh, so F-trace allocates these dynamic trampolines for callbacks, as I was describing. And when you're on this trampoline, uh, you're about to call into the function callback that registered to run when this function executes. And you're on this dynamic trampoline uh, about to do that. And you get preempted right in the middle, right? The task gets preempted right in the middle of that. And something else is running. Now that something else or whoever disables F-trace, and the trampoline is gone, right? Now the task gets preempted back. It gets CPU back. And boom, like, you know, the trampoline is gone. Crash, right? So the solution to that is task RC, which Paul added some time back. Uh, basically, it me, uh, you know, we define RCU to be to use these properties. If you are in a, uh, if you are on a trampoline, it means you are on a read side critical section. If you, if the task blocks, that means you are in a quiescent state. And a grace period basically means you take all the tasks on the system, and you wait for all of them to block. All of them have passed the quiescent state. Grace period has ended. So that's the definition of task RC. OK. We're trying to not have us free the trampoline when something has preempted. Now, when I say preemption, I mean preemption, I mean, uh, preemption and not blocking. A task doesn't go to sleep. Uh, the difference is, I believe, involuntary preemption and voluntary preemption. Voluntary preemption is something when to sleep, and involuntary is it got preempted. So let's see how the solution works. What F-trace does is it disconnects the trampoline. So something is uh, running on the CPU. Uh, you know, some task gets preempted while it's on the trampoline. Uh, so we are in that situation. F-trace, when it's disabled, disconnects the trampoline Okay, uh, from the function. And we're not going to free it yet. F-trace is disabled, but we're not going to free that trampoline yet. We get preempted back to it. And uh, remember I told you the grace period will end only when the task sleeps. If it gets preempted and it's still on the CPU, then it's not going to end the grace period. It has to sleep. All the tasks have to sleep since we started the grace period. Since we disconnected the trampoline, all the tasks have to sleep. Finally, everything slept since we start disconnected the trampoline. Everything went to sleep. And we can now free the trampoline. It's safe. Nothing can be on it, ever. So quiz question is, let's see how many of you were listening to Steven's talk when he was talking about uh, trampolines, OK? <laughs> What if I had an implementation like this? What if I said RCU, you know, this is actually a question I asked two years ago. <laughs> it's a puppy dog right there. Uh, what if I had RCU read unlock, uh, lock and unlock on the tram trampoline, and I said synchronize RCU? Why wouldn't this work? No one was listening. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because RCU read a lock itself is on the trampoline. So if we get preempted in the, before RCU read lock has done its thing, then we're screwed. Like, it, it means nothing, right? But, you know, the, the RCU read mechanism cannot be on the trampoline at all. Being on the trampoline means you're an RCU reader. But we cannot allow the trampoline to make that decision. We have to imply that you're on a trampoline, so you're an RC reader, OK? Same reason you cannot use preempt disable, preempt enable in the trampoline. It will just not work. OK. Unfortunately, uh, I, I don't have time to go over this topic. But to give you a gist of what this is, this is RC flavor consolidation. It's the work we've been doing for the last year or so. And before we had uh, different RCU uh, reader flavors, uh, you had the RCU sketch flavor, which 
um, basically is if you are not preemptible, then you are an RC reader. And if you're not, if you're preemptible, then that can imply a quiescent state. That's the RC SCAD flavor. We had the RC BH flavor, which was introduced for denial of service attack. What you could have is you could be in an RC reader and you could get bombarded by soft IRQs and you could ultimately run out of memory <laughs> because the soft IRQ was preempting the RC readers. So the BH flavor was added by someone, which uh, makes the fact that your BH disabled itself as a uh, itself as the RC reader. So you you know the RC reader for for those use cases can itself be the BH disabled part. So that's the RCU BH, and then you have the RCU preempt uh, flavor, which was introduced if I remember for the uh, for the real time real time uh, stuff. You can get you know, preempted in the middle of an RCU reader and still not end the grace period. It's, ve it's very uh, strange, but it, 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 it makes sense. Just because you got preempted in the middle of an RCU reader doesn't mean that uh, the grace period has ended in an RCU preempt reader. It keeps track of the task, and that task still blocks the grace period, the one that got preempted. So you had all these flavors. We had these uh, complicated uh, set of a uh, APS for each flavor. We had different state machines, that RCU state uh, tree that I was showing you. We had three of those for each of those flavors. We had three grace period threads. We had all this stuff, right? So the, the consolidation work basically combines all the RC readers into one, and they all, uh, you know, if you're in any of those reader sections, you are blocking the grace period. That's the idea of uh, consolidation. Okay, and it has resulted in less resources and less code because the state machine is now one, it's not duplicated, uh, less code, et cetera. And I really wanted to talk a lot about a lot of <laughs> how it works and, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> yeah. And we thought we solved scheduler deadlocks. The scheduler has a rule where if scheduler uses RCU and you disable IRQs across the RC read unlock, you have to disable it across the whole thing. And we thought we solved it, but uh, consolidation introduced more deadlocks. And I have an article on scheduler deadlocks. If you have nothing else to do, feel free to. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long, long article on that. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, please. Uh, uh, keep in touch. Um, yeah. You can follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, talk to the you know send email to RCU mailing list. Uh, we don't bite. We're very friendly people until we do bite. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you get the idea. So thank you very much.